Hello there, YouTube. Devin here again. Hello. Happy New Year's, everybody. Uh, today I have a video to show you on the Swiss entrenching tool, and this would be the folding pattern. This entrenching tool might still be in limited use with the Swiss military. Um, this would be kind of adopted around the 60s uh, to replace the straight-handled, square-bladed version that you saw in a previous video on my entrenching tools. This is obviously based off of the American M43 entrenching tool. It actually shares a lot of similarities other than just being your traditional Swiss, much, much higher quality, much, much better materials, and everything like that. Um, it's just a very, very all-around good entrenching tool. This one stayed in my car for quite a number of winters, and I actually have used it to dig my car out. Not that I ever really have gotten it stuck or anything, but like the snow plows will come by um, and whitewash behind all of the vehicles, and then it's hard for a car to get over that kind of mound of snow if your snow plow driver is not very good, which a lot of them are not. So I've used this to kind of break that up and kind of lower it down so my car can get over it a little easier. Um, now, the first thing you might notice about this entrenching tool is that it has a leather carrier still. Um, for you might be thinking, well, the mid-60s is kind of late to still be issuing leather equipment. Now, I get asked a lot, why did some countries have leather equipment for so long? And a lot of it, it comes down to is, what do you have access to? Um, now, a lot of the really big military investing countries uh, in the world uh, often went to cotton by now. By, you know, the 40s, you would see cotton uh, kind of as the standard and going as far back to basically kind of World War I, pre-World War I eras, you would see the bigger empires um, switch to cotton. Now, the U.S. military and the British military, the reason they went to cotton, and they went to a really nice set of cotton gear, both of them did, kind of in the pre-World War I eras, is because they had access to cotton. Cotton was cheap. Cotton webbing was really, really cheap. They grew cotton. The British Empire had access to Egypt and India and stuff like that, and, you know, lots of countries in Africa where they produced cotton, and they had a very, very well-developed textile industry. That is something you would see that inspired the British to adopt, you know, very early cotton um, uniforms and very, very early cotton webbing equipment. Same thing with the Americans. They grew cotton in the American South and they had a very, very prominent textile industry. That's why they would be using cotton for so long. A lot of the countries that would stick with wool and leather uniforms for an incredibly long time, uh, a lot of countries in Central, Central Europe, you know, uh, France, uh, Switzerland, Germany, um, even Russia to an extent. A lot of countries stick with leather equipment and wool uniforms, for one, because wool is really good for their environment. It, it works really well, and they have access to that. They have access to, to sheep and to cows, and that is why you would see a lot of wool uniforms and a lot of leather equipment for so long in some of these countries because they wanted to control their own supply chain rather than relying on foreign exports to support their military until modern, obviously, textiles would come out, such as nylon and polyester and stuff like that, in the 90s becoming widely available, that you wouldn't really see a switch over to kind of webbing in a lot of these countries. So, Switzerland would be one of those countries. They would be using wool uniforms for quite a long time and leather equipment for quite a long time. It's just how it was because they had access to cows and they had access to sheep and stuff to produce wool. Um, you, They liked having that. They liked having that self-reliability and you like to be able to control stuff that you are producing for your own military so you don't have to rely on anyone or you end up being Greece in World War One, where all of your rifles and all of your ammunition ammunition are being made by Austria-Hungary who you are now at war with and they're obviously not going to sell you rifles and ammunition to shoot at them. They didn't want that to happen so that's why you would see leather equipment for so long. So if I take this entrenching tool out of its very very beautiful carrier here you'll see that the date on this carrier if I dust it off here is if I get it close to the camera there is 1975 if it focuses ever uh if i could get the shine on it maybe it'll it'll be a little easier to see maybe there it is 1975 and it's got the approval stamp and everything like that that's 
a pretty late piece of leather equipment in the grand scheme of things as far as other countries would go. And it's the same keyhole and stud type attachment for everything that Switzerland has been using for almost, at this point, 200 years. Which is a very long time. They were very, very good at making leather equipment and to the point where I have some Schmidt Rubin pouches dated 1891 that are still holding up to this day. Now, the entrenching tool itself is based off of the American M43 pattern entrenching tool. You could see a lot of similarities to those of you American fanboys out there, or the fact that basically everyone has adopted an M43 at some point because it was the next logical step from a fixed handle, um, just kind of straight pattern uh, entrenching tool. You would see the folders become very prominent. Now, this is an incredibly heavy, incredibly overbuilt in traditional Swiss fashion uh, tool. It is incredibly incredibly heavy its blade has these three same reinforcement ribs in it just like the american m43 that you really really don't need um because it is much thicker than an american m43 obviously six rivets holding it in place it has the three positions that the blade can be in on this trapezoid shape and it's held in place by just this this kind of ring lock that you see here um, now you would twist this to unlock it to remove tension from that um, this washer that you see here, a set of washers, and then you could unfold your blade. You could either have it in the pickmatic style, so you could use this to, to scrape along the ground or kind of chip at the ground and stuff like that, or you could have it all the way out, obviously in addition to the, the stored position. So you could have your entrenching tool. Now this is once again an incredibly heavy, incredibly overbuilt entrenching tool. It spent a long time in the uh, car and everything like that. Now I haven't been taking care of the wood so um, mine has you can hear that ever so slight play in it but it is a very very nice handle. Now I've got tiny hands um, but this is a very very nice handle. I like this kind of octagonal milling that they put in the wood here. Um, it's much nicer to get a grip on than a round one, I think, and it takes just enough girth off the handle to fit in my hand, which again is tiny. Um, so this entrenching tool, obviously you might be able to see uh, some yellow under there. It is primed and then covered in this olive green material. It is very, very heavy. It's actually much heavier than the fixed handle one. Um, and it is a little bit longer actually. So if that's something you like, if you like kind of a longer entrenching tool, this is kind of uh, up there as far as long entrenching tools go. It's about the same length as the American M51 that I have also done in a previous video. And so now we'll get on to what everybody likes to see. We'll get on to the chopping. We'll see how good it is. Now I'm running out of stuff to chop because I haven't been paid in like a month because HR for this new job is taking their sweet time figuring out my pay. So what we have here is we have a potato. Now this is a Yukon gold potato of kind of medium size. And we're gonna see how good this thing kind of chops and cuts because an entrenching tool is a very powerful melee weapon and with the weight of this thing, we're not gonna let much more than gravity kind of do it. I'm not really gonna be applying any downward pressure. I'm hoping this doesn't kind of skip and move everywhere, which would be absolutely horrendous. So, um, and then maybe we'll try doing a little slicing or cutting at it, you know, choking up on it like a true fancy French chef knife to see if we can, you know, chop some of these potatoes up for cooking because you should be able to use your entrenching tool for that too. From everything from being a boat paddle to a grappling hook to a chef's knife to an axe to a horrendous cleave you from the neck down into your rib cage melee weapon. Um, so we're going to kind of try that out today on this beautiful potato here. So we'll give it a good kind of six inch chop right in half didn't take anything at all. I didn't apply any downward pressure. It's a it's a fairly clean cut. It's not entirely flat as you can see. Um, but now we'll we'll choke up on it like a like a chef's knife here and we'll we'll try to kind of see if we can cut some. Now this isn't a very sharp entrenching tool unfortunately. So this might not be the best use of this but um, if it had been a little sharper this might be okay at slicing. It's doing all right with its incredibly dull, how I received it, factory edge. A lot of people do sharpen one edge of their entrenching tools or serrate them or something like that. But you can see that it hasn't done an, a, a bad job. That's a relatively straight cut on that potato there. If I can line it up. There you go. 
And it, it seems to work reasonably well for, for chopping and for cutting. This would easily, you know, very easily hurt somebody. Um, it works quite well. It's got enough weight behind it, which is something, you know, people talk about an entrenching tool being one of the heaviest pieces of equipment you would carry. And it is usually by a lot, but I tend to like a heavier entrenching tool because having that weight behind the head, that force behind the head, is going to allow you to chop trees a lot more you know it's going to allow you to have a lot more field applications um, and especially sharpening one edge uh, of the entrenching tool now normally I like to a lot of people like to sharpen the left edge because they're right-handed but that's normally the edge that I'm using to like cut wood and stuff like that so if I'm trying to use the other edge to be extra finely sharp to like cut stuff to make food um, I'll oftentimes cut uh, sharpen the right edge to be able to do, do slicing kind of finer work with it because you can choke up on this and you can get these to a lot of very good edges There's usually very good steel in these entrenching tools And as you can see you have actually a really comfortable grip if you choke up on this grip to use it to kind of chef knife stuff It's kind of awkward, but once you get used to it, it's a nice straight edge You can do some pretty fine field cooking with this actually and then when you're done if you have a Unpainted one you could set that right on the fire and cook on it like, you could literally heat this thing up. You don't need to get it, like, really close into the fire to where you're starting to ruin the temperature, temper of the steel. But you can heat this up enough to where you can cook something on it. Which is what I really, really like the versatility of the entrenching tool is. You can use it as a mess kit. You can use it as an axe. You can use it as a boat paddle. You can sharpen it and use it as a, sh a fine precision chef's knife, even. Its possibilities are only limited by your imagination. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. I'm sorry about the humming. Uh, the fridge is running and mine's very, very old. So the compressor is quite loud on it, but that refrigerator is going to outlive all of us. So thank you all for stopping by. Hopefully you enjoyed this type of video, all that other good stuff. Consider becoming a supporter of Patreon, which I will leave a link to down at the bottom. We didn't quite make our goal for 2021 of reaching $100 a month. We're still about $31 away. Uh, from that but if you are feeling generous and you do like the content I make it all goes back into the channel and stuff like that especially since I haven't been paid in a month and uh, I'm waiting for all of this back pay to come but who knows when that will happen so that would be uh, super super nice of you to choose to support the channel so I don't have to pay for as much out of pocket thank you all for stopping by happy new year's once again I will see all of you here in the next video bye bye now